The next phylum, the annelids, the annelida. Annelids are segmented worms. You have both aquatic annelids and terrestrial annelids. There's about 22,000 species of segmented worms on the planet as we speak. So the annulus, that comes from the Latin, and it, uh, it is a ring that divides the body into segments. That's why you have segments. That's why it's a segmented worm, because you have this annulus that is like a ring that sort of pinches the body a little bit between segments. And that's why you have segment after segment after segment, segment because you have these annuli. Now, um, annelids are triploblastic. Remember, that's three embryonic tissues, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. Annelids are bilater bilaterally symmetrical. So, in other words, if you, if you cut an earthworm down the center lengthwise, the left side will be a mirror image of the right side. That's bilateral symmetry. They have a head and an earthworm means... But it does have a head end, but it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't look like a head, but it has a head end. Um, it has the, its body and the pygidium, which is the tail end. Segments, like with the um, tapeworm, segments are added at the head end, so it grows goes backwards, right? You don't add a new segment on the tail because that's the end of the worm. All right, a clitellum is a reproductive structure that we see in terrestrial earthworms and it forms a mucus that aids in the transfer of sperm. We see this in oligo, oligochiates, which are the um, terrestrial earthworms. If you've gone fishing with earthworms before, you're familiar with the clitellum. All right, um, annelids or hermaphrodites, they have te both testes and ovaries in the same animal. They are coelomates, they have a true coelom. They have an outer cuticle, which is a protector la protective layer of collagen on the outside to protect them. Because, you know, think, think about how earthworms burrow through the soil, so they need something to protect their skin, protect their body. That's the cuticle. Uh, the digestive system is complete in annelids. Remember, we didn't have a complete digestive system in the flatworms. It's complete here. There is a mouth, there is a pharynx, esophagus, a crop, a gizzard, like in birds, and an anus. So a complete uh, alimentary canal here. Um, the muscular system, uh, annelids, earthworms have circular muscles and longitudinal muscles because they sort of undulate through the soil. So you have to be able to move both ways, side to side and front to back. And they have a closed circulatory system, interestingly, because there are some animal, some higher animals than um, the annelids that have an open circulatory system. So it's interesting to me, this very, very simple primitive animal, an earthworm, has a closed circulatory system. It has five hearts, they're really kind of like pseudo hearts. I mean, they're big enough. So when you dissect an earthworm, you can see the five, you can count them, five hearts. Um, but they're just sort of like individual little pumps. It's sort of um, little pumps in series. Um, but five hearts, you want to call them hearts, that's fine. And they have both dorsal and ventral vessels, top and bottom, on the back side and on the stomach side. They have blood vessels or circulatory vessels, and their um, circulatory um, fluid is hemoglobin. So, so they use an iron-based fluid just like humans. Hemo, that's iron. So hemoglobin is that big protein in our red blood cells that carries oxygen to the cells and carbon dioxide back to the lungs. So earthworms have hemoglobin, interestingly. 
Okay, leeches are annelids or segmented worms also. They are the aquatic um, version, right? We have earthworms that are terrestrial. Leeches are aquatic. And they feed on blood. Of course, they're parasitic. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever been snagged by a leech? It's, I mean, it's, it's a kind of a neat experience, a, a neat interaction with the natural world, kind of like getting stung by a jellyfish, right? If you've had that experience, then, you know, you've you've had a unique experience, interaction with the natural world. Well, going out into swamps and things, as I did in graduate school, I picked up leeches. You know, they you, it's summertime, you wear shorts, and you're wading through this water, and leeches get on you. So they attach themselves to you. Earthworms are terrestrial annelids. They feed on organic particles in the soil. Setae are tiny extensions that aid the earthworm, earthworm's movement through the soil. So they're not legs as such, not like legs on a, a millipede or centipede, but they're just little, again, hair-like extensions that kind of move back and forth that help the worm move through, bore through the soil. All right, gas exchange, respiratorily speaking, gas exchange occurs through the skin, right? You can imagine you're an earthworm down, you know, two feet in the ground. How are you going to breathe? It has to be through the skin. By simple diffusion, by the way, semester one, the nervous system consists of, again, cerebral ganglia or a cerebral ganglion. So now we've gone from two ganglia to a centrally located ganglion in the head region. Brain, is it a brain? In, in my mind, it's not a brain, but in some um, uh, sources you read, some texts you'll see uh, earthworms with a brain and lateral nerve cords. On the reproduction side, internal reproduction, because these, these animals have both um, gonads, um, both testes and ovaries, so they can fertilize themselves, or cross-fertilization during copulation. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute where two worms get together. Now, worms are hermaphrodites, right? So they can act as male or female when they, when they get together and copulate. The clotella um, kind of like fuse together and sperm is transferred between the organisms, and that's how you get a variety within the species. And a cocoon is produced at the clitellum that stores the fertilized eggs. I have pictures. Now, leeches. See, clearly see, this is very cool. You can clearly see the segments going on here with this leech. And now back in, in the old days, right, as we all... Back in the olden days, in colonial period, they used to bleed patients. They used to physically put leeches onto a patient's skin, and those leeches, right, they're parasitic, and they feed on blood, so they suck out the blood. And the thought was back then that the leech, if a person is sick, you put some bunch of leeches on them, and the leeches suck the blood, and the infection is in the blood, so the leeches suck the infection out. That was the idea back in the 1700s. Interestingly, even today, leeches are back in fashion in the medical field. And for instance, so, so here we see a patient with some uh, medically applied leeches there. And so it's really, it's, again, it's kind of cool because someone, you could have someone that gets a like um, gets your hand cut off, but but they put it back on. You know they're able. They have the technology, where if you lose an arm or a leg, you can have it stitched back on and then have it reunited with the body, and, and eventually it will function. And what happens is they'll they can reattach the limb or the hand, for instance, and then put leeches on the hand, and those leeches will suck. You know they're they're going to feed on the blood and they draw the blood into the hand that's been reattached. 
So they're essentially helping restore circulation into the hand. You got to think that's incredible. I certainly do. All right. With regard to earthworms, here you can clearly see back here segments. You can clearly see the segments here. Um, and, and this little um, enlargement here, that's the clitellum. Remember, these, these animals are hermaphroditic, so they have both ovaries and testes. And when they copulate, they link up via the clitella and they transfer sperm between them. And there is a picture of um, two earthworms copulating. Here's the clitellum there. There's the clitellum there. And what they're doing is they're, they're passing, you know, this one passes its sperm over and this one, I mean, this one passes its sperm over, this one passes its sperm over. And those sperm then can fertilize the other animal's eggs, and then that's where you get diversity within the earthworm population. Here we see some anatomy. Um, see, it says accessory hearts. Um, but yeah, when you dissect these guys, I had I had my um, seventh grade. I, I taught seventh grade life science and had my students dissect earthworms. And they actually, one, two, three, four, five, you can count the little hearts. Here's the mouth end, there's the clitellum, there's the anus end, um, there's the coelom. These are coelomates. Uh, there, see, it says brain here, but I don't really consider it a brain, but it is, it is a centralized, um, centrally located bundle of nerve cells which is it, it's evolutionarily it's heading towards a brain but to me it's it's ganglia it's more certainly more advanced than the flatworms but it's not quite a brain yet but there's a lateral nerve cord here on this side you can't see the other one on the other side All right, so next phylum in the world of invertebrates are, are, is nematoda. That's the phylum. The nematodes are roundworms. So we looked at flatworms, we've looked at segmented worms, and now we're looking at roundworms. They are free living, they are parasitic, they're about 28,000 species. Nema, nematode, the name comes from nemos, which is Greek, which means thread or thread like, um, which is to say that these worms are really kind of thin, and some of them are very long, some of them not so long, but, but they are very thin. And so the powers that be decided they are kind of thread-like, so they call them nematodes. They are triploblastic, remember three germ cell layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. They are pseudo -coelomates. Now, pseudo means false. Coelom is the gut space. I'm gonna show you a picture that will hopefully, if you're confused about the coelom, that will clarify the three, um, compare the three side by side. But uh, nematodes have a false coelom. Initially, it looks like a coelom, but it's really not. We'll see it in the cross section. And so we've seen the flatworms, which are acelomates, no coelom. We've seen the annelids, the segmented worms, which have a coelom. They are true coelomates. I think your book uses the term U. Coelomate, E-U, coelomate. I just call them coelomates, but your book um, likes to be fancy with those kinds of things. It says E-U, coelomate. Remember, E-U, like, like eukaryote, E-U means true. So E-U, coelomate means a true coelom. Um, but the nematodes are pseudo coelomates. They are bilaterally symmetrical. They are cylindrical, and they have a cuticle made of chitin, which uh, is just a harder um, outer layer. I use this term loosely, outer skin layer, that so they don't get damaged. Remember, they're parasitic, so they're living inside of another animal. So you got to have some kind of protection. They live in all habitats, um, both aquatic and terrestrial. Um, 
uh, they have a complete digestive system, mouth, pharynx, intestine, rectum, and anus. So right away here with the nematodes, you're getting more sophisticated, evolution, evolutionarily, you're getting more sophisticated with the digestive system because remember in the um, segmented worms, you had a crop in there as well. But here we have a pharynx, intestine, a rectum, and an anus. So we see all those structures in humans. Um, with regard to the muscular system, um, nematodes have longitudinal muscles only. Remember that segmented worms have circular muscles and longitudinal muscles. So the ne nematodes only have one kind of muscle. It's longitudinal, and that's why if you've ever, ever seen um, nematodes or roundworms, they, they kind of flip, flip side to side to move around. That's because they only have one kind of muscle. They can't move up and down, back and forth. They can only like flick, flick themselves side to side. As far as our nervous system goes, they have longitudinal nerve cords, but there are four of them. So now we've gone from two nerve cords to four nerve cords in the nematodes. Ventral on the stomach side, dorsal on the back side, and two lateral. So we've picked up two nerve cords. So right there, we're more sophisticated than, a, um, than an earthworm. And they have a pharyngeal nerve ring. So now we've gone from a ganglion or a collection of ganglia or a bundle of nerve cells. Now we've gone to a nerve ring. So now it's becoming more structural. Is it a brain? Well, to me, it's still not quite a brain, but it's much more sophisticated than a ganglion. We're working towards a brain here. Uh, as far as reproduction goes, nematodes are monoecious. Interestingly, so each worm can fertilize itself. However, there are males and there are female worms, and the males are much smaller than the females. But in some species of nematodes, there are males and females. And other species, they can self-fertilize. They're monoecious. Larvae grow through four stages. Um, okay, I don't. You don't necessarily have to remember all the four stages, but there is a stage called dower, which is no growth. So as they go, th as they're working through the four stages, they can go into a stage if, if conditions become unfavorable for growth, then they can go into a condition called dower, D-A-U-E-R, which means they're not growing at all. They're not doing anything, and they're waiting until conditions become favorable, and then they can start growing again. And so we hear, uh, here we see um, a male and a female roundworm, nematode. Um, males in this particular species, the males, have a testis here. Females have a big ovary there. Um, they have a mouth. They have a mouth. They have a pharynx, they have an intestine, and they have an anus. Here's the anus on the female, anus on the male. And let's see, oh, there's the nerve ring, okay? So it's more sophisticated than a simple cerebral ganglion, but it's it's still not a brain. All right. Okay, Ascaris is a very common um, roundworm that infects humans. It parasitizes humans, mainly children. And so what happens here? Oh, my gosh. So, okay, so here's the male and female Ascaris roundworms. The females make the eggs, of course. Males make the sperm. Unfertilized eggs, look, will not undergo further development, but if the eggs get fertilized here, right, now we have a zygote. 
then that zygote is going to go through its process of cell division, right, mitosis, and then you're going to get two cells and then four cells and then eight cells and 16 and so on and so on and so on until you get, um, an, it says, embryonated egg with an L3 larva. Okay, that's your little larva worm. And then some stupid kid comes along and eats dirt and ingests and ingests these eggs. <laughs> the eggs go into the lungs, they hatch, the little worms, little larval worms go into the intestine, and now the kid has worms, intestinal worms. So the larval worm, or, or the fertilized worms, the zygotes are in the dirt. Remember that zygotes form embryos. Now embryos in the, in the dirt, that's what you see up here in number three. <laughs> embryos. I love children. Don't get me wrong. I love children. Embryos are in the dirt, and these <laughs> dirty... <laughs> Dirty kids come along and they eat the dirt. Oh, I don't mean they eat dirt. Oh, some kids may eat dirt. I don't know. <laughs> but kids play in the dirt, right? And they get their hands dirty and then they pick their nose and, you know, scratch their heads and they stick their fingers in their mouths. And so in that way, they may ingest embryonic worms, uh, larval worms in the dirt. Those larvae travel to the lungs or those embryonic eggs travel to the lungs the the eggs hatch and those larval worms right they're in the respiratory system the kid feels the worms squirming around in the respiratory system so they cough right and this phlegm comes up and it has these embryonic worm uh, larval worms in it and then they swallow the worms. Now the worms are in the digestive tract. And now, and now the kids have intestinal worms. And now the kid poops. <laughs> because these eggs are over, or, or they become adults and they start doing their thing and they make more eggs. They make more zygotes. And the kids go to the bathroom and out come zygotes. And also outcome worms. And, um, they're called in, in children. Sometimes we refer to them just generically as pinworms because they're little tiny. But that's how parents find out that their kids have worms because the kids poop and they're behind itches and then they poop. And then the parent can see the living worms squir squirming, squiggling around in the feces. And that's how the parent knows to take the kid to the doctor and get some medicine to get rid of the worms. I love children. <laughs> it's, it's a roundworm world. Here is Ascaris. So here's a roundworm in all of its glory. Head end. We don't really see a lot of detail here, but you, you can see they're translucent almost transparent and in this case they're backlit so they look transparent but roundworms really are translucent now there are some roundworms that can born to the skin so here you see a roundworm and this happens a lot of times in in tropical areas where people walk around on their bare feet and then they step on uh, something they get a wound and some dirt gets into the wound and that dirt has um a, a zygote, you know, fertilized egg in it, and then the egg hatches, and then you get this worm under the skin. I had had a friend that actually um, ended up having one of these roundworms, parasitic roundworms, under the skin. You can actually see it crawl, move under the skin. Of course, you go to the doctor, and you get medicine, you get rid of that, but it's, again, this is an experience with the natural world that I've never had. But it certainly would be interesting. Now, when my anatomy physiology students in lab dissect cats, many of the cats that we dissect, they come from cat farms. And many of them have worms. And those worms are parasitic roundworms, nematodes. 
And so you cut into their stomach, right? You 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 dissect them and you identify the, the, my students identify the stomach, and then I'll inevitably say inevitably say cut in the stomach and see what's in there, or a curious student will say, can I cut the stomach open and see what's in there? Sure, go ahead. Sometimes you get a lot of food. Many times you get lots of roundworms, lots of nematodes, and you can pull them out and they look like that. Pretty disgusting, yes, but pretty cool to see that. In fact, um, <laughs> in, in my anatomy lab, I like to collect unusual specimens. So one time one of my students cut open a cat, a, a stomach, and there were lots of worms. So I collected the worms, rinsed them off, put them in the jar with some preservative, and I have it on my shelf even today. And that's why here they're giving a dog some worm medication. That's why you deworm your dog and deworm your cat so you don't have this situation. All right, the coelom tooth. Okay, so here's a diagram that I said I was going to show you about coelms. So this is from your book. You can see there's EU coelomate, U coelomate. I just say coelomate. So here is an animal, cross section of an animal with a coelom. Now the coelom is this internal cavity. I call it the gut space, just that's just my terminology. It's this internal cavity. And here is the digestive tract, this hole, this space right here. Okay, so you can see the digestive tract or alimentary canal is lined with endoderm. And then you have this middle layer of tissue, that's your mesoderm in this sort of green color. And in this blue is the ectoderm. So they're, they're trip, triploblastic. There's your three germ layers or three tissue layers. Okay, so back to the intestine here. So it is surrounded by mesoderm and further supported by mesoderm so that you have this internal organ that is completely surrounded and supported by mesoderm and then you end up with this space outside of the organ so outside of your so your stomach is surrounded and supported by mesoderm but outside of your stomach is just open space not really open but if you cut a human in half you'll see a space largely a space that's the coelom so the coelom is the space that remains after the internal organs are surrounded and supported by mesoderm all right look at the difference with the acelomate here we have the digestive cavity surrounded by endoderm, but then that is completely encased in mesoderm. There is no space out here, like here. Okay, it's solid mesoderm. There is no space. So it's an eight coelomate. There is no coelom. This being the coelom. Now the pseudo coelom. Okay, so we have the earthworm here. We have the tapeworm here, and this is the roundworm. Now look at the roundworm. These these guys are pseudo coelomates. So there's the digestive tract surrounded by endoderm. That's normal. Now, here is this big space surrounding the digestive system. But you'll notice the digestive tract is not supported itself and surrounded itself by mesoderm. There's mesoderm there, right? These are triploblastic animals, but that mesoderm makes no connection with the digestive tract. 
However, there is a space between the digestive tract and the mesoderm. So it appears that there's a coelom. See the white space, but there's really not. It's a pseudocelum. Here we have the digestive tract completely surrounded and supported by mesoderm, leaving the space here, which is a coelom. Here we have digestive tract with a large space, but there's no connection between the endoderm here and the mesoderm there. So it looks like a coelom, but it's really not. It's a pseudocelum. Let's go to the video all about worms from NG Science. Check it out. See you on the other side. All right, time for a quick check. Which of the following statements about worms is false? Check all that apply. Your choices, all worms are triploblastic. Round worms have a cuticle made of chitin. Tapeworms are dioecious. Flukes do not have a body cavity. Earthworms breathe through their skin. Let's take them one at a time. All worms are triploblastic. Remember, triploblastic means three germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. So yes, all worms, flatworms, roundworms, segmented worms are all triploblastic. Round worms have a cuticle made of chitin. That is true. Remember, round worms have to survive the digestive system, so they need to have a tough outer layer to do that. Tapeworms are dioecious. Now, remember, tapeworms, um, the adult tapeworm is consists of a series of connected proglottids, and proglottids are have both male and female gonads in them, they can self-fertilize or they can fertilize between proglottids. But there is no male tapeworm and no female tapeworm. So that is definitely false. Flukes do not have a body cavity. Now, a fluke is a flatworm um, like the planarian that I showed you, right? A flatworm. And planaria, as we discussed, is an acelomate. So the coelom is the body cavity. So fluke being a flatworm does not have a body cavity. Flukes are acelomates. They do, they do not have a body cavity. So that's true. And earthworms breathe through their skin via diffusion. And we know that's true. Preguntas, any questions?